Welcome back, fourth grade. We are reading Tuck Everlasting. We're on chapter 12. The sky was a blaze of red and pink and orange, and it's doubled tremble on the surface of the pond like colors spilled from a paint box. The sun, the sun was dropping fast now, a soft red sliding egg yolk, and already to the east there was a darkening to purple. Winnie, newly brave with her thoughts of being rescued, climbed boldly into the rowboat. The hard heels of her buttoned boots made a hollow banging sound against its wet boards, loud in the warm and breathless quiet. Across the pond, a bullfrog spoke a deep note of warning. Tuck climbed in, too, pushing off and settling the oars into their locks, dipped them into the silty bottom in one strong pull. The rowboat slipped from the bank then, silently, and glided out tall water grasses whispering away from its sides, releasing it. Here and there, the still surface of the water dimpled, and bright rings spread noiselessly and vanished. Feeding time, said Tuck softly, and Winnie, looking down, saw a host of tiny insects skittering and skating on the surface. Best time of all for fishing, he said, when they come up to feed. He dragged on the oars. The rowboat slowed and began to drift gently toward the farthest end of the pond. It was so quiet that Winnie almost jumped when the bullfrog spoke again, and then from the tall pines and birches that ringed the pond, a wood thrush caroled. The silver notes were pure and clear and lovely. Know what that is all around us, Winnie? said Tuck, his voice low. Life, moving, growing, changing, never the same two minutes together. This water, you look at it every morning, and it looks the same, but it ain't. All night long it's been moving, coming in through the stream back there to the west, slipping out through the stream down east here, always quiet, always new, moving on. You can't hardly see the current, can you? And sometimes the wind makes it look like it's going the other way, but it's always there. The water's always moving on, and someday, after a long while, it comes to the ocean. They drifted in silence for a time. The bulldog spoke again, the bullfrog, sorry, spoke again, and from behind them, far back in some reedy secret place, another bullfrog answered. In the fading light, the trees along the banks were slowly losing their dimensions, flattening into silhouettes clipped from black paper and pasted to the paling sky. The voice of a different frog, hoarser and not so deep, croaked from the nearest bank. Know what happens then, said Tuck, to the water? The sun sucks some of it up right out of the ocean and carries it back in clouds, and then it rains, and the rain falls into the stream, and then the stream keeps moving on, taking it all back again. It's a wheel, Winnie. Everything's a wheel, turning and turning, never stopping. The frogs is part of it, and the bugs, and the fish, and the wood thrush, too, and people but never the same ones, always coming in new, always growing and changing, and always moving on. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it is. The rowboat had drifted at last to the end of the pond, but now its bow bumped into the rotting branches of a fallen tree that thrust thick fingers into the water. And though the current pulled at it, dragging its stern sidewise, the boat was wedged and could not follow. The water slipped past it, and out between clumps of reeds and brambles, and gurgled down a narrow bed, over stones and pebbles, foaming a little, moving swiftly now after its slow trip between the pond's wide banks. And farther down, Winnie could see that it hurried into a curve around a leaning willow and disappeared. It goes on, Tuck repeated, to the ocean. But this rowboat now, it's stuck. If we didn't move it out ourselves, it would stay here forever, trying to get loose, but stuck. That's what us tucks are, Winnie. Stuck. So we can't move on. We ain't part of the wheel no more. Dropped off, Winnie. Left behind. And everywhere around us, things is moving and growing and changing. You, for instance. A child now, but someday a woman. And after that, moving on to make room for the new children. Winnie blinked, and all at once her mind was drowned with understanding of what he was saying. For she, yes, even she would go out of the world willy-nilly some day. Just go out, like the flame of a candle, and none, and no use protesting. It was a certainty. 
She would try very hard not to think of it, but sometimes, as now, it would be forced upon her. She raged against it, helpless and insulted, and blurted at last, I don't want to die. No, said Tuck calm no, said Tuck calmly. Not now. Your time's not now. But dying's part of the will, right there next to being born. You can't pick out the pieces you like and leave the rest. Being part of the whole thing, that's the blessing. But it's passing us by, us Tucks. Living Living's heavy work, but off to one side. The way we are, it's useless, too. It don't make sense. If I knowed how to climb back on the wheel, I'd do it in a minute. You can't have living without dying. So you just, so you can't call it living what we got. We just are. We just be, like rocks beside the road. Tuck's voice was rough now, and Winnie, amazed, sat rigid. No one had ever talked to her of things like this before. I want to grow again, he said fiercely, and change. And if that means I've got to move on at the end of it, then I want that too. Listen, Winnie, it's something you don't find out how you feel until afterwards. If people knowed about the spring down there in Tree Gap, they'd all come running like pigs to slops. They'd trample each other trying to get some of that water. That'd be bad enough, but afterwards, can you imagine? All the little ones, little forever. All the old ones, old forever. Can you picture what that means, forever? The wheel would keep on going round, the water rolling by the ocean, by to the ocean, but the people would have turned into nothing but rocks by the side of the road. Because they wouldn't know till after, and then it'd be too late. He peered at her, and Winnie saw that his face was pinched with the effort of explaining. Do you see now, child? Do you understand? Oh, Lord, I just got to make you understand. There was a long, long moment of silence. Winnie, struggling with the anguish, anguish of all these things, could only sit hunched and numb, the sound of the water rolling in her ears. It was black and silky now. It lapped at the sides of the rowboat and hurried on around them into the stream. And then, down the length of the pond, a voice rang out. It was miles, and every and every word across the water came clearly to the to their ears. Pa, pa, come back. Something's happened, Pa. The horse is gone. Can you hear me? Someone stole the horse. Chapter 13. Sometime later, the man in the yellow suit slipped down from the saddle and tied the tuck's old horse to a bar of the foster's fence. He tried the gate. It was unlocked. He pushed through and strode up the path to the door of the cottage. Though it was very late now, almost midnight, the windows glowed golden. The family had not gone to bed. The man in the yellow suit took off his hat and smoothed his hair with long, white fingers. Then he knocked at the door. It was opened at once by Winnie's grandmother, and before she could speak, the man said quickly, Ah, good evening. May I come in? I have happy news for you. I know where they've taken the little girl. Chapter 14 there had been nothing for the tucks to do but go to bed. It was too dark now to go out looking for the horse thief, and anyway, they had no idea when he had done his thieving or which way he had gone. That beats all, though, don't it, Pa, said Jessie, coming up to a person's house and stealing their horse right out from under their nose. I got to give you that, said Tuck, but the question is, was it just some ordinary thief, or was it someone that had some special reason? I don't like it. I got a bad feeling about the whole thing. Hush now, Tuck, said May. She was spreading a quilt on the old sofa, making it into a bed for Winnie. You're too much of a worrier. There's nothing we can do about it now, so there's no sense fussing. You got no reason to think there's anything peculiar about it anyway. Come on, we'll get a good night's sleep and figure it out in the morning when we're fresh. Boys, you go on up and don't get talking. You'll keep us awake. Winnie, child, you bed down, too. You'll sleep first rate on that sofa here. But Winnie did not sleep at all, not for a long, long time. The cushions of the sofa were remarkably lumpy and smelled like old newspapers, and the chair pad May had given her for a pillow was thin and hard and rough under her cheek. But far worse than this was the fact that she was still in her clothes, for she had firmly refused the offer of May's spare nightgown when it seeming miles of faded cotton flannel. 
Only her own nightgown would do, and the regular bedtime routine without them, she was painfully lon lonely for home. Her joy on the road that morning had completely disappeared. The wild world shrank, and her oldest fears rolled freely in her conscience. It was unbelievable that she should be in this place. It was an outrage. But she was helpless to do anything about it, helpless to control it, and exhausted by the conversation in the rowboat. Was it true? Could they really never die, these tucks? It had evidently not occurred to them that she might not believe it. They were only concerned that she keep the secret. Well, she did not believe it. It was nonsense, wasn't it? Well, wasn't it? Winnie's head whirled. Remembering the man in the yellow suit was the only thing that kept her from weeping. He's told them by now, she thought, rehearsing it. They've been looking for me for hours, but they didn't know where to look. No, the man saw which way we were headed. Papa will find me. They're out looking for me right now. She went over it again and again, lying wrapped in the quilt, while outside the moon rose, turning the pond to silver. There was hint of mist now that the air was cooler, and the frogs talked comfortably. Crickets soon joined in with their shrill, rhythmic, rhythmic song. In the table drawer, the mouse rustled softly, enjoying the supper of flapjack crumbs May had put there for him, and at last these things were clearer in Winnie's ears than the voice of her thoughts. She began to relax, listening to the sound-filled silence. Then, just as she was drifting into sleep, she heard soft footsteps and May was beside her. You resting easy, child, she whispered. I'm all right. Thank you, said Winnie. I'm sorry about everything, said May. I just didn't know, just didn't know other way but to bring you back with us. I know it ain't very happy for you here, but well, anyway, you have a good talk with Tuck? I guess so, said Winnie. That's good. Well, I'm going back to bed. Get a good sleep. All right, said Winnie. But still May lingered. We've been alone so long, she said at last. I guess we don't know how to do with visitors. But still in all, it's a good feeling you being here with us. I wish you was ours. She put out an awkward hand then and touched Winnie's hair. Well, she said, good night. Good night, said Winnie. Tuck came to a little later to peer down at her anxiously. He was wearing a long white nightshirt and his hair was rumpled. Oh, he said, you still awake? Everything all right? Yes, said Winnie. I didn't mean to go disturbing you, he said, but I've been laying in there thinking I ought to be setting out here with you till you went to sleep. You don't have to do that, said Winnie, surprised and touched. I'm all right. He looked uncertain. Well, but if you want something, will you holler? I'm just in the next room. I'll be out here like a shot. Then he added gruffly, it's been quite a time since we had a natural growing child in this house. His voice trailed off. Well, try to get some sleep. That sofa there, I guess it ain't the kind you're used to. It's fine, said Winnie. The bed's no better or I'd switch with you, he said. He didn't seem to know how to finish the conversation, but then he bent and kissed her quickly on the cheek and was gone. Winnie lay with her eyes wide. She felt cared for and confused. And all at once she wondered what would happen to the tucks when her father came. What would he do to them? She would never be able to explain how they had been with her, how they made her feel. She remembered guiltily that after supper she had decided they were criminals. Well, but they were, and yet... And then a final visitor made her confusion complete. There was a creaking on the loft stairs, and Jessie was looking down at her, very beautiful and eager, in the faint blue moonlight. Hey, Winnie Foster, he whispered, you asleep? This time she sat up, pulling her quilt around her in sudden embarrassment and answered, No, not yet. Well, then, listen. He knelt beside her, his curls tumbled and his eyes wide. I've been thinking it over. Pa's right about you having to keep the secret. It's not hard to see why. But the thing is, you knowing about the water already and living right next to it so you could get there any time. Well, listen, how'd it be if you wait till you're 17, same age as me, heck, that's only six years off, and then you could go and drink some, and then you could go away with me. We could get married, even. That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? We could have a grand old time, go all around the world, see everything. Listen, Ma and Pa and Miles, they don't know how to enjoy it, what we got. Why, heck, Winnie, life's to enjoy yourself, isn't it? What else is it good for? That's why I say. That's what I say. And you and me, we could have a good time that never, never stopped. Wouldn't that be something? 
Once more, Winnie adored him, kneeling there beside her in the moonlight. He wasn't crazy. How could he be? He was just amazing. But she was struck dumb. All she could do was stare at him. You think on it, Winnie Foster, Jessie whispered earnestly. Think on it some and see if that don't sound good. Anyway, I'll see you in the morning, all right? All right, she managed to whisper in return. She slipped away then, back up to the creaking steps. Oh, he slipped away then, back up the creaking steps. But when he sat upright, wide awake, her cheeks burning. She could not, not deal with this remarkable suggestion. She could not think on it, for she didn't know what to believe about anything. She lay down again, finally, and stared into the moonlight for another half hour before she fell asleep. I will see you soon with chapter 15.